Good morning. <laughs> um, uh, it's hard to believe it's only the second full week of school. It feels like we've been here forever. <laughs> uh, just kidding. But honestly, it's a good feeling to get back into the groove of things after a long summer break. And all the new folks are hopefully feeling not so new anymore and settling into a routine. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking to you about reach and how to sign out. <laughs> and <laughs> And everyone's favorite acronym, um, CISO. And uh, so right now I'm going to walk you through how to sign out if you're going to um, be leaving for the weekend. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm actually going to talk to you about my summer. Yeah. <laughs> but if you do have any questions about how to sign out for the weekend, please stop by. I will help you. Um, all right, so here we go. Last year, I was very graciously awarded a grant from the Professional Development Committee to attend a 200-hour yoga certification course in Rye, New Hampshire. Um, this is the beach in Rye, if any of you are familiar with coastal New Hampshire. Um, full disclosure, I'm actually on the committee that approves the requests. <laughs> so frankly, I was kind of a shoe in but I am grateful nonetheless. As part of that gift, I am required to send a note of thanks to the benefactors of TAF that make the grant possible, and I thought I could combine the thank you note with a morning meeting for top efficiency. Um, so here I am, two birds, one stone, using my thank you letter to give you some life advice. Uh, so first, why a 200-hour yoga certification? Well, the truth is it was kind of a backup plan. I had originally applied to a graduate program at Columbia University. I researched a few elite programs. I got Mr. Mack and Mr. Trina to write me glowing recommendations. I studied for and took the required standardized test, which I crushed, by the way. <laughs> um, I bragged to a lot of people about my summer plans to go to an Ivy League school and get my master's degree. I even made travel plans around the program, booking a flight uh, that I was going to a wedding um, and I booked the flights in and out of New York because I assumed I would be like starting school the next week. Um, so after all that smugness, you'll be shocked or maybe not shocked to know that I did not get in. After a few days of making up a lot of excuses why I had been so obviously and egregiously overlooked, <laughs> I felt very sorry for myself and I was blaming people I know that did get into the program for taking my spot. <laughs> um, I dragged myself into Ms. Trainer's office for some sympathy, uh, some affirmation that I wasn't a total loser, and at the very least, a new summer plan. It was then that Ms. Trina had the clever idea to look into yoga training programs. Um, I lead yoga at Taft in the winter, I have for the last three years, which up to this point has basically entailed watching yoga DVDs with the group and more or less lying on yoga mats in the dark for 40 minutes, four times a week. Um, at first, I scoffed at the idea because I had never thought of myself as an actual practitioner of yoga. But alas, as everyone knows, you should always listen to Ms. Trina because she is usually right. So that's what I did. I ended up committing to a 200-hour yoga teacher training program run by the Bar and Soul Yoga Studio out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It was, incredibly, it was an incredibly well-organized, intense program lasting four weeks, Monday through Friday from 7.30 in the morning until 5.30 at night. Apart from two or three hours of yoga practice every day, we also learned about anatomy, sequencing, Thai massage, Ayurvedic medicine, inversions, devotional chanting, meditation, yogic philosophy and tradition, chakra energies, alignment, how to run a successful studio, pranayama, which is the practice of controlled breathing, how to adjust students, how to make a suitable playlist, and how to verbally cue the various movements. It was a lot. Of all the things I learned, however, I had a few higher level takeaways that I wanted to share with you. I promise no planks or downward facing dogs. So number one is I can do hard things and so can you. Uh, it's human nature for us to avoid discomfort, pain, exhaustion. Uh, if you're anything like me, you have spent most of your life avoiding these things. I am and always have been risk averse and I tend to gravitate towards things I know I'm already good at. For a lot of you, your parents make sure you avoid hurdles and discomfort by what experts are now calling snowplow parenting, wherein they clear the path ahead of you 
making sure your life journey is smooth and easy. And sometimes, let's be honest, that is great. Thanks, mom and dad. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit embarrassing, like if your parent or someone from home calls your teacher and says, oh, Susie has this a runny nose, like, can you make sure she has tissues? You know, like, and you're like, oh my God, mom, please don't do that. Um, and sometimes it prevents you from bouncing back or learning from challenges. I'm here to tell you, however, that enduring a really hard time, a challenging class, a sticky roommate situation, a tough conversation is totally worth it. Believe me, after two days of yoga school, I was ready to quit. And I was like, Taft will never know. I'm just going to stop going. <laughs> it was challenging. It was so hot. I felt that I wasn't very good at it, uh, though any good yoga teacher will tell you there's no such thing as being good at yoga. Um, I was staying alone in New Hampshire with Scout, and I didn't know anybody in the area. I was eating dinner alone, which, I, incidentally, I encourage you to do that, eating dinner at a restaurant by yourself, I think builds character. Uh, <laughs> but I committed to finishing, and I knew it was good for me, and I promised half that I would, so I stuck it out, and I'm really grateful that I did. In yoga, they say the pose you least feel like doing is the one you need to do the most. Similarly, sometimes being a grown-up means sitting down and enduring something you would much rather avoid. It is calling that parent you know is going to be upset with you. It's sticking, out in, uh, sticking it out in honors chemistry even though you can't seem to get a grade higher than 82. It's trying to use Gmail even when first class feels like a comforting old friend. <laughs> it is getting told no and not pushing back or making excuses or begin pleading a defense but rather just sitting with that no. Enduring hard things makes you a stronger and better version of yourself. So push yourself to do hard things and recognize that the discomfort means you're actually growing. Number two, not every moment or experience is meant to be fun, cool, or exciting. <laughs> every single morning of yoga teacher training began exactly the same way. We would arrive in our space, we would unpack our books and roll out our mats, and, you know, we'd make chit-chat about what we had for dinner or a movie we watched or something. And then our teacher would boot up her speaker and we would dance. Freestyle dance <laughs> in a room with eight women for three songs. It was so painful for me. <laughs> I felt so uncool. I felt so uncool that I was like, in my head, I'm like, I'm a teacher, I can figure this out. Like, why do I feel so uncool doing this? Like, how can I make this better? How can I get used to it? I dreaded it every single day. Um, I was so jealous of the other women in the group that would skip and shake and prance around the room. And I would be like scanning around, trying to make eye contact with someone else to knowingly, so we could be like, yeah, this is crazy, right? Like, we don't want to do this. <laughs> but no one did. They were just totally into it. <laughs> um, I kept thinking, if these were my students, and I could tell they felt uncomfortable, I would be the first person out on the floor making myself look foolish or anything to try to make you guys feel at ease. But that was just the thing. The dancing wasn't about feeling or looking cool or about making a joke about dancing to be funny. It was a chance every day to wake up your muscles and your bones and to pay attention to how you were feeling and how you were thinking. Yoga practitioners talk a lot about being in your body or having a heightened awareness of each and every joint, tendon, movement. And dancing just happened to be the way my teacher liked to get us out of sort of that autopilot mode and into our bodies. The idea, this idea that not every moment in your life is meant to be cool goes directly against our Instagram filter universe or the idea that you shouldn't post a photo unless you've carefully curated a very cool scene from a very cool moment wearing a very cool outfit and then you spend several moments trying to write the funniest very cool caption. Life is messy. It can, life can be happy but it can also be sad. Life can be boring. You will not be totally engaged in every morning meeting um, and or every class discussion but the truth is no one owes you constant entertainment. Allow yourself to experience things exactly as they are. Allow yourself to be bored from time to time. Take your thumb off the Cairo Instagram filter and your foot off the gas pedal and just experience life just as it is. 
By the way, the dancing did not get any easier. <laughs> I didn't figure out a way to make it glamorous or fun or cool, and I just did my boring like snapping and swaying, <laughs> literally like this in the corner, for 10 minutes every morning, and I hated it the whole entire time, right up until the end. <laughs> Uh, number three, balance and space. Yoga teachers talk about space a lot. Space in your lungs, space in your side body, which is something they're always saying. Side body, breathe into your side body. Uh, space between your ears and your shoulders. In fact, uh, let's, take all, uh, let's all take a minute to make some space between our ears and our shoulders. Uh, you might be unconsciously cringing for me right now <laughs> or holding tension in your neck for other reasons. So take a second to roll your shoulders back and down your back. Or in my yoga voice, plug your shoulder blades into your back body, <laughs> to, to borrow a, a phrase. Um, physical space and paying attention to where your body is and how it's moving and feeling is obviously really important to us yogis. All of that said, mental balance and clarity are two of the most important goals of yoga practice and philosophy. In fact, the whole point of the physical movements of yoga or asanas is to engage in a moving meditation to clear your mind of attachments. Uh, the practice of asanas is just one of eight limbs of yoga, the goal of all eight being to meditate and clear your mind. So finding mental space to hold disparate thoughts and letting go of those ideas that are bringing you stress and anxiety are critical parts of the, of the practice. Uh, the idea of balance is of course key to the practice of yoga as well. Sometimes you have to actually balance like on your hands or on one leg. Uh, sometimes you have to find mental and emotional balance. <laughs> And interestingly, in yoga, balance is almost never about taking something away to balance out, but rather adding more of the opposite force to create homeostasis. Strength strengthening your core to assist your back bends, for example, or the idea of grounding down through your feet um, and as, with as much power as you are radiating energy through your hands. Uh, we spent time learning about counter-stretching and balance in the body making sure you're even on all sides. In Ayurvedic medicine, which I, by the way, could talk endlessly about if anyone is interested, um, if your body composition is hot, you don't necessarily take away hot foods, but you add cool ones to balance out your Ayurvedic dosha, which I'm like fascinated by this, so if anyone wants to talk, I'm here. Um, okay, so I think this might be the most important thing I learned at yoga school. It is applicable to basically every moment of every day of my life, both at Taft and outside the gates. In fact, I think it might be the secret of life. <laughs> yes, that's right. I think I discovered the meaning of life at yoga school, and I'm going to tell it to you right now at morning meeting. <laughs> As a civilization, we're becoming really polarized. We tend to define ourselves by, by what we are not. Or once we've established what we are, we can then make these blanket statements about what that means. We leave very little space for balance. So for example, if I'm a Democrat, that means A, B, C. If I support the sec I raise my hand, I say I support the Second Amendment, then I'm obviously this, that, and the other thing. If I'm singularly focused on achieving my specific goal while I'm here at Taft, that puts me in a really narrow category from which I should not stray. I teach in the woo, therefore I am 100% this and 0% that. You get the idea. Our desire for righteousness often leads us down this narrow path and making us un unable to hear other opinions, points of view, and perspectives. It's this concept that in order for me to feel right, someone else has to be wrong, and it's really damaging. At yoga school, I learned that true balance is allowing myself space to be and to think, more than one thing at one time even to give myself the space to be a lot of things at once, sometimes completely opposing things. I can be the same amount of opposing forces in one human at one time. For example, I can be a yoga teacher and a math teacher. I can have my yoga teacher certification and not a master's degree in educational leadership from Columbia <laughs> and still be good at my job. I can take JV field hockey really seriously and have the game ball from the time we beat Greenwich Academy at Greenwich Academy in my office with the date and score written on it. It was the best day of my life. <laughs> and I can be moved to tears of joy when the team is eating cookies, lying on the turf in the afternoon sun after a tough game. 
I can care deeply about the traditions and goals and guidelines of Taft's dress code, and at the very same, same time, I can admit that I don't actually mind if someone wears a hooded sweatshirt over their polo shirt. And by the way, I can also understand, respect, and relate to the folks that mind a lot about sweatshirts at the same time, too. And I'm here to tell you that you can do this, too. Now, mind you, it is not easy to hold space and balance in your brain and in your heart. It takes a lot of work and personal reflection. You could practice yoga every single day for years and years and still need to restart every morning. I find I am gently reminding myself several times a day to breathe, like right now, <laughs> uh, to take a pause and give the folks I'm working with a little bit of space and to give myself a little bit of space too. In my work in the dean's office, I'm often asked to make a decision on the spot, to draw a line in the sand about what I think about a certain scenario and decide right then. Often while the person asking about the scenario stands right there <laughs> and stares at me. Sometimes the person is tapping their foot even. I'm really grateful that the folks I work with often have the advice of, okay, let's take a little while to think about this and see where we land in an hour or at the end of the day or tomorrow. My colleagues give me space to think, and for that I'm really grateful. It makes me a better leader, and I think it makes Taft a better school. So again, my goal in sharing with you today is twofold. I do want to thank the Professional Development Committee and the shepherds and donors of those grants for allowing me this opportunity and encouraging me to go for it. Thanks to Columbia University for literally nothing. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> if I didn't have to sit with that no, I wouldn't be here thinking about a lot more yeses with all of you. But most importantly, I hope you will take these lessons and carry them with you. Remembering to be nice to yourself as you endure hard stuff. Have faith and conviction to stick it out, even if it's not your favorite. And to give yourself and those around you a little space as we all try to muddle through and be the best versions of ourselves, missteps and all. Finally, I will leave you with a traditional yogic send-off. You've probably heard people say namaste before. There are plenty of memes like namaste all day, and like namaste in bed and stuff. There are plenty of memes in cutesy tank tops and things you've seen online. But what I understand the word to mean is that the light and the good in me sees the light and the good in you. Or there's a lot of cool things about me, and I see and acknowledge there's a lot of cool things about all of you. I respect you enough to give you the same amount of space I would give myself. So I ask that we say this together now. You can bow your head if you want. You can put your hands at your heart center if you want. You can put them at your third eye. This is your third eye, like right between your eyebrows if you want. Um, or you can do neither or none of the above. Um, but I'm here to tell you that the light in love in me sees the light in love in all of you. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you very much.